car too. I'm focusing on learning to care for myself right now. This event has consumed my life and it's affecting everything including my job. I'm slowly easing back into doing pull-ups and push-ups and taking walks. A big victory is drinking water each day. These little things are adding up and helping me stay focused. It's just so damn hard. I appreciate you and everyone else replying and being so supportive. Comment. I felt like I was falling down a hole and the person who always helped me through my toughest situations was now the enemy and couldn't pull me up. I am stuck feeling like I can't forgive and can't forget this. I know this event did a number on my brain because I am having war dreams again that I used to have after I got home from Iraq in 2005. These dreams only occur in times of immense stress and it's always the same dream with slight changes. I feel paranoid and unsafe and on guard all time because I can't handle getting hurt like this ever again and I'm afraid of it happening again. I think part of this is the trauma problem. That, of course, means your amygdala are running at high alert and keeping you on edge all the time. You'll notice in van der Kolk's work that the amygdala doesn't have a really close connection with the prefrontal cortex of the brain. You can't talk yourself out of trauma. That's why your therapist employs Ender. Scientists don't truly understand why it works. Maybe it's the way it mimics the processing we do in REM sleep. But it does tend to cool those heightened responses. I clearly remembered all the traumatic events that I processed through Ender. But afterward, I was no longer getting the visceral response to those triggers I had been suffering with. I do think working through it all with Ender will eventually help you. That said, it's possible that this is just a deal breaker for you. For some people, adultery is simply unforgivable. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with those people. These are people who generally take full responsibility for their own actions, and they expect that level of reciprocity from their mates. Some of them know right away, but most don't. Most have to figure it out over a period of time. So, that's something to think about. I can tell you what worked for me, but even so, it's all over the place and certain aspects of my healing were in a different time frame from where you are now. I had always thought I was in the deal breaker camp. You sometimes find out new information about yourself after divorce day, right? 17 years ago, when the cheating was still just online, my first stop was an attorney's office. I'd already met with one before I even called my wife home to confront him. And years later, the first words out of my mouth were we're done. So, it's weird how your mind can change. No one was more surprised than me to discover I was even open to reconcile over the course of the next few weeks. I developed some empathy for my wife. He was messed up, right? And I was angry about it, no doubt about that. But after more than 30 years of taking care of him and being there for him, it felt unnatural to just cast him off. I knew that the latest of the O had her hooks in him and I knew that he'd be ruined. I could not not care about that, no matter how much I wanted to. This led to a huge sense of duality. When I was working the problem from his POV, I felt calm, almost detached and clinical. When I worked it from mine, I was a mess, shattered and inconsolable. And like I told you earlier, that sense of ambivalence is normal. I had one foot out the door even though I wasn't admitting to it. And that went on for a long time. There has to be a period of time and reconciliation for the BS to observe whether or not the wife is serious about making real changes. Are they really willing to remediate their broken character? And this time of observation is just hellish because you're dealing with all that pain and all those triggers and all the insecurity of not knowing if you're going to get hurt again. Meanwhile, the process of reconciliation requires that we allow vulnerability. This feels like emotionally reinvesting in a dangerous option. And the more you reinvest, the more you worry that you're going to get crushed again. Here's the thing though, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was not reinvesting blindly like I had before. I already had an exit plan in hand, and I knew there was a possibility of failure on his part. And the more I sat with that, the more I realized that I wasn't really afraid of getting hurt. I just thought I was because I was so scared of the reaction I'd had before. I was afraid of the pain. What I've discovered is that yeah, I love him, but I don't need him. He's no longer in a position to cause me that kind of pain again. I've reinvested in the relationship, but not blindly and not to the degree where it defines me. He hurt me worse than I thought I could be hurt, and I made it through. If push came to shove, I'd make it through again, and I know that it wouldn't take a quarter of the time. My fear wasn't really about what my wife might do. It was about my suffering and not wanting to suffer like that again. But he doesn't have that kind of power over me anymore because when it comes to my emotions, they're under my control. I've learned to connect suffering with ego, much like Buddhists do. So much of my suffering was caught up in how could he do this to me. It's almost a primal cry of outrage, right? But what I noticed is that my me was in gigantic letters and a fancy font. It's a weird sort of outlook and it's so hard to explain. Our self-esteem takes such a crushing blow when we're betrayed this way. And it's a good thing to focus our healing energy on ourselves, to rebuild the sense of self in a healthy way. 
If we're smart, we're engaging in good self-care and giving ourselves lots of compassion and TLC. But there's also an unhealthy bit of ourself which is inconsolable about how our me got violated by this betrayal. And I say unhealthy because this part keeps us from allowing the bad behavior and bad choices of our wives to be singularly about them. It leaves us in that primal scream of how could you do this to me? If I reel this back in though and take a closer look at it, my ego, me capital letter me believes that I deserve better than that. And you know what? I did. That's true. But in the context of the real world, where cheating occurs in about 50% of marriages, the idea that this could happen shouldn't have been such a shock. And it really was a shock. I've never been quite so shocked in my life. It really did happen to me, and it happened to you, and it happened to every BS on this board. And it's happened to about half the married people on this planet. How am I so special that it couldn't happen to me? That this kind of injury would be impossible? That God or the universe should have protected me? And the answer, of course, is that I'm not. I'm not above the poor judgment and poor choice of my cheater any more than you are insulated from yours. So, who am I to think I should have been, or should be, impervious to this kind of injury? I don't control other people. I don't control my spouse. I can't see into his head or make his choices for him. And that makes me, just like everyone else this has ever happened to. Nobody gets any special protections from infidelity. My egotistical me is shrunk back down to size, and my suffering along with it. This isn't something which gets rid of the suffering. It just cuts it down to size. I'm not a Buddhist, and I do think that a certain amount of acknowledging and building of the self is a good thing. It's when our sense of self keeps us stuck or when it doesn't allow us to let other people carry their own baggage that it becomes outsized. My wife's cheating was about him. It was never about me, but there was a part of my ego which just couldn't accept that. And now it does. The dirty little secret of reconciliation is that we're working toward forgiveness. Hell, it wasn't until this year that I could even use the word forgiveness in reference to my wife's betrayal. I'm more than six years out too, so you see that you're not abnormal to be struggling with it. Another problem I had was justice, and that had to be solved first. What my wife did to me was not fair. Of course, it wasn't. Nothing to do with infidelity, and betrayal is fair. But how do you deal with that? On the one hand, I wanted or... On the other was this sense of allowing myself to be treated like a doormat without any repercussion. It was intolerable, and not at all possible to sustain. In true R, there's a period of time where the wife is naturally in the one-down position beneath us. They're remediating their issues and they haven't yet built back trust. But eventually, the goal is true equality within the relationship again. But how do you allow that amount of injustice to go, right? My wife crushed me like bug on windshield crushed. It was the worst thing I'd ever experienced and it cut to the core of me made me question everything I thought I knew and brought me to existential crisis. I can't just say, that's okay because it's not. I did recognize very early on thought that punishment is not compatible with reconciliation. We can't rejoin the team and then punish our partner without punishing the marriage as a whole, and hence, ourselves. And by this time, I'm thinking no way I'm going to tolerate any more punishment. I've had plenty, thank you. But there was this outstanding debt my wife owed me too, sticking in my craw and making me feel like if I didn't do something, I was allowing it. In the end, I basically made an accountant's trick of it. I sort of mentally totted up what I felt like he owed me, subtracted his hard work toward character remediation and relationship recovery. Then, I wrote off the balance as non-collectible. I can't stand around forever waiting for payment which can never come. There's no coin which can compensate for the kind of pain he'd caused me. And yes, there were lots of things he could do to help but it was never going to be enough to cover the entire balance. There's just no way for a wife to pay us back for our anguish, no matter how badly they might want to. But we really do have more control over that sense of debt than we think. I didn't want a lopsided marriage where I win every fight because he cheated. If we were going to do this, it was important to me that we find a way to be equal partners again. So, there are a few ideas about how to overcome that feeling of being stuck. I hope I explained them in a way that made sense. These ideas tend to make more sense in my head than they do on the page. And if you're thinking that I've had to change the way I think to some degree in order to accommodate my wife's betrayal, you'd be right. No one was more shocked than me to find that I was open to reconcile at all. But as far as I know, you really can't reconcile unless you're willing to re-examine some of your preconceptions. I didn't believe I could forgive, but I found ways which made it possible. And I do not feel like a doormat because of it or feel in any way inferior. In fact, I feel stronger, like I can handle whatever my wife dishes out. If he reverted back to what he was when he was cheating, I still have that backup plan in place. And I guarantee you that emotionally, I would be fine. I'm uncrushable by him at this point. 
I can't really explain why that is, but I can tell you that after you've worked through all the pain and grief, you get to the other side and you're no longer afraid they might hurt you again. Remember too that there really does come a point where you have to take ownership of your choice to be where you are. You are free to leave. It might be difficult, and you might wish it were different, but knowing that you can leave whenever you want makes it easier to own your choice to stay. With all the information in hand, you're making a choice as to where you'll plant your feet. His choice has not been foisted off on you at this point. You have all the facts, and your agency has been returned. So, you own that choice. When you do, you can stop feeling so victimized by your wife and by circumstances. Anyone can be made into a victim, right? But we don't have to stay in there, living inside that victimization. Instead, we can feel our power. We can even use it if needs be. We have the power to make choices and to change our mind if those choices make us unhappy. Embrace that power. It's yours, and no one can take it away from you at this point. Even six years in, I stand here because I choose to, not because I have to. And if my wife makes me unhappy, I will exercise my power, my agency, to make a different choice. Life is fluid, not static. You aren't bound forever by your choice to try to reconcile the key word here is try, meaning you might put your best effort in, and still feel the need to make a different choice down the road. You are in charge, right? Bear in mind that a year and a half seem like a long time. But healing is two minus five years for most of us. Year two is particularly difficult because the shock has worn off and you're still trying to figure out how you feel, decide what you want, and grieve for what's been lost. Your case might be complicated by a history of PTSD and re-traumatization, but where you are in the process is really quite normal. Try to be patient with it. Remember that you are not locked into your reconciliation decision. All any BS can do at this point is to try it on and see how it feels. There's nothing wrong with deciding that it's not for you if it comes to that. Feel your agency and allow it to make you comfortable in your choice to R or to choose divorce if that's what's right for you. Original poster, I don't even know what to say. That a complete stranger would take the time to give so much insight, guidance, and advice is incredible. For some reason your words really resonate with me. I just want you to know how appreciative I am that you'd share your experience and provide advice to a complete stranger. Honestly for me, I had a 100% zero tolerance adultery perspective. I saw so many soldiers get screwed over when I was serving and also some really close friends. I always told them you need to leave that cheater. Look what they did to you. Values and virtues mean everything to me. I am by no means perfect, but my virtues are a cast iron wall with no secret ways in or out. For me, there is black and white, but then it happened to me. This is why I appreciate your writing about the ego and me. Really good advice, by the way. But this happened to me and now my 100% zero tolerance policy is wave red. I still love my wayward wife. Do I want to throw away the last 12 years or try to reconcile and see if this is doable? I am trying, but the first hurdle is me getting over it. For me, it just happened still. I suppose I still feel the shock. I am deeply wounded, and thoughts are constantly seeping in and it's a full-time job just trying to let those thoughts run their course. Again, sage advice. Some of my conversations with my wayward wife right now are about this timeline of 2 minus 5 years. She is worried that 2 minus 5 years seems too long for me to be on the fence and her to not know if this will work out. I agreed that I don't want to live her miserably for two minus five years. I am doing the best I can right now. I am committed to trying to heal and committed to trying R. But like I said, I just don't know if I can mentally get over this. I guess at some point I'll wake up and just know whether I can or can't. I have only had two Ender sessions at this point and I know the process will be long. I have just asked her to hang in there with me while we try. I really think the priority needs to shift here from working on the marriage to getting you back on your feet. I'm not saying that you should throw in the towel. I'm just saying that getting you healthy needs to come first. Toward that end, maybe talk to your doctors and tweak med or whatever needs to be done and concentrate on self-care, meaning proper nutrition, hydration, exercise, and continued avoidance of alcohol. You're doing Ender and that's good, but it's also draining because it's an immersive therapy. So, special care to make sure that you're having a period of rest, relaxation, and positivist after each session. If you're not already journalist, consider giving it a try. Basically, you just pour all the poison, uncensored, onto the page. Follow each entry with some optimistic positives. It can be anything which makes you feel happy, birdsong, the smell of fresh coffee or newly mowed grass, an affirmation that caught your eye, anything, so long as it's uplifting. You're training your brain to search for optimism. You've got time to work out all the other stuff, and I'm not suggesting that you stop, only that you prioritize strengthening yourself. If you've got an inner critic yammering in your ear, try challenging his aspersions. That's basic CBT, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy. Our inner critic is all about making us feel bad 
and he tell lies to get it done. Challenge those lies with the truth. Follow up with supporting facts. That is, your inner critic says that you are at fault for your wayward wife's adultery. Don't just take that lying down. You know that you don't have control over other people's choices. You know that you have no say over whether they honor their stated values or commitments. You know that there are always other options. She could have talked with you honestly about the outside attraction. She could have insisted on counseling. She could have packed a bag and left. But she didn't. She chose to cheat, to deny you of agency on a decision which affected your life. That's on her. Every time you catch your inner critic wailing in your ear about one of your alleged failings, challenge it with the truth. It's so important when you're caught in a depression to lift yourself up, because if you allow that unhappy voice in your ear to keep you down, you'll be extending the length and depth of depression. The body and the mind are connected. You'll see that clearly in Van der Kolk's book. So, just like the military advice Bigger gave you, double down by posting sentries and keeping your inner critic at bay. He's not there to help you. He's there to make you wallow and give up. He is the sickness. He is the depression. Fight him with facts. I know it doesn't feel like it today, but you're going to be okay. You're surrounded by people who have come through this, and you will too. Believe it and it will be true. Original poster, I want to thank you again. Your post about unmet needs and everything has had me thinking a lot about a lot. I have reread it many times. Would you mind going into a bit more detail about the flawed teachings of unmet needs or is that explained more in the books you recommended? I appreciate you and everyone here so far giving me good advice. It feels nice to feel validated and not crazy. Thank you again for all your information. We are in the unmet needs dance currently. I am worried that I can be emotionally open enough for my wayward wife. I'm a pretty stoic person by nature and my time in combat has enforced the strong silent type. I have my ways of showing love but it's different from what she needs and I'm trying to learn to adapt. We were recommended the five love languages book like you mentioned and we are both reading that. My wayward wife says she doesn't blame the unmet needs. She said she made a poor choice and at the time she used her unmet needs as validation for her choice. I'm going to be rereading and thinking everything over. Mentally, I am a disaster right now. It takes everything I have to get through work at a functional level. My virtues and boundaries are tall and strong like you said. I even have a virtues magnet on my fridge the warrior's nine noble virtues that my wayward wife gave me ages ago. This is why the struggle is so hard for me and the pieces don't fit. I was in the same unmet needs category as my wayward wife, and I never even put myself in a precarious position. Thanks again for all your information and feedback. I am just navigating this entire mess and trying to find myself. Here thanks for your input and your appreciation. I will check out that article. Bonds formed in combat are intense and last forever. I do really miss that sometimes. I felt safe with my brothers and sisters when I was active duty. I put more value on friendships than some. When things were depressing and poor at home, I made more efforts to be with friends, always inviting my wayward wife. She didn't want to participate because she felt I wasn't focusing on us or the marriage and putting more emphasis on things outside of us like friends and activities, which I was. It was all I could do to fight off depression. I didn't know how to tell my wayward wife how depressed I was with the state of our marriage. If there's one thing the divorce day has taught me, it's to speak my mind at every moment. No more emotionally checking out because I'm upset. Trauma is such a beast. Comment. So, what is it that you feel like is keeping you stuck in the pain? Bear in mind that it's normal at this point. Healing is a two to five year process, but what's bugging you the most at this juncture? Very kind, LC. If I ever do write that book it's going to be titled, Meeting Your Needs Like an Adult Without Effing Up Your Marriage and Traumatizing Your Spouse. Although, that might need some trimming. Original poster. I think what is bugging me the most is just how everything happened. It's difficult to put into words but I'll try. My brain is scrambled eggs at this point. I came home after losing my grandmother and found my wayward wife had an entirely new life going on. One that started a few months before I left. Her new life was at the level that she was even talking to AP's mom about our issues and the AP's mom was supporting my wayward wife. Just trying to take this all in at the same time as meeting a monster who used to be my wife. I felt like I was falling down a hole and the person who always helped me through my toughest situations was now the enemy and couldn't pull me up. I am stuck feeling like I can't forgive and can't forget this. I know this event did a number on my brain because I am having war dreams again that I used to have after I got home from Iraq in 2005. These dreams only occur in times of immense stress and it's always the same dream with slight changes. I feel paranoid and unsafe and on guard all time because I can't handle getting hurt like this ever again and I'm afraid of it happening again. Despite the continued reassurance from my wayward wife. I am continuing Ender with my individual therapist and she has me focusing on only myself and healing the affair in myself and on my timeline. Perhaps when I remove more pressure and urgency and stop shouldering responsibilities that aren't mine, 
things will start to move. I'm going to look at the author you suggested. I do appreciate science-backed advice. I guess I still can't believe this happened and I'm worried about reconciliation because I just feel completely and utterly abandoned. This is the worst experience in my life. My wayward wife knows I have one foot out the door at this point but with 12 years behind us, I'm trying to stick it out to see if reconciliation is possible. Comment. I just feel like there's a giant voice in my head saying not to let anyone treat you this way. Listen to that voice. None of us should ever accept being treated with the disrespect infidelity. However, this is not the real issue. It's if we want to divorce or if we want to attempt reconciliation. Yes, you do reconcile with the person that treated you that way, but by its very definition reconciling is reaching an agreement with whomever you are reconciling with. You don't have to reconcile with those that haven't done you any harm. If you and your wayward wife reconcile, then it's not an acceptance of that she did this to you, nor is it in any way or form telling her that it's okay to have an affair. I have told you this is a war. During wars individual skirmishes and even individual battles aren't necessarily important. General Washington took part in more battles where he was on the losing side than where he won. Yet he won the war. He did so because he won the battles and skirmishes that mattered. This is a key issue IMHO. If you set off getting out of infidelity with the intention of winning every confrontation every day, you are doomed to fail. The goal should rather be that tomorrow you feel slightly better than today, and that within a reasonable time you will realize you have survived infidelity. Is the affair over? Do you feel assured? Or do you have assurance that your wayward wife is not in contact with Om? Um? How safe are you on that issue? The below advice is based on this being something you are feeling pretty safe about. One idea is to create a ceasefire. Maybe agree on a 30-day period where the only requirement you make to her is that there is total and absolute NC with Om. Um. That NC needs to be defined, like she can't talk to him, be around him, have him on social media, Google him, drive past his house, whatever you need to feel safe. That time needs to serve a purpose, like you are following our advice on exercising, eating, resting, like you are gathering your wits and learning about infidelity, its consequences, what tools and methods are available to get out. You can talk about relationship issues, but it's not the focus. You can live together, eat, spend time together, sleep in the same bed. Only you two are not focusing on the relationship, but on personal healing. The key to this is her assurance that the affair is over. I mentioned earlier that you have options. Well, make it clear to her that you do have these options. Your choice right now is to see if you two can eventually work this out. But you also realize that the minute you don't think that's attainable, you have the option of filing for divorce. It's not something you ask her for, but something you do. But also make it totally clear to her that she too has the very same option. If she can't respect NC for 30 days, she always has the ability to tell you she's divorcing. There is nothing forcing her to be married to you. If Om is the dog's balls, then she can go to him right now because you neither want to nor are capable of forcing her to remain married. The realization of this freedom for both of you can be a major turning point. One thing you should do during the 30-day ceasefire is to read up and understand divorce in your area. Just as you research reconciliation, knowledge is power, uncertainty is fear. Knowing what you are facing, be it along the path of divorce or reconcile, is what will help you most in dealing with the issues. This is not saying you will or need to divorce. Look at it like learning first aid, something you do just in case you need it. Original poster, I appreciate your input and you are correct. I do feel like I am in war in a lot of ways, not that I want to be with my wife, but some days feel like that. I know the affair is completely over. We are both full-time work from home right now and I have kept tabs on her phone. She has been very willing to show me every time she gets a call or text, and we check in quite often. I do feel a sting when I hear her phone go off or even if she gets up in the night to use the bathroom, but from what I read, those feelings are normal for now. Our options have been made clear. I told her I am working on healing and working on myself, and I may or may not be able to get over this. She knows that. I have told her if she needs to go, I will respect that too. For now, it seems we both want to try to see if anything is salvageable. I'm focusing on learning to care for myself right now. This event has consumed my life and it's affecting everything including my job. I'm slowly easing back into doing pull-ups and push-ups and taking walks. A big victory is drinking water each day. These little things are adding up and helping me stay focused. It's just so damn hard. I appreciate you and everyone else replying and being so supportive. Honestly for me, I had a 100% zero tolerance adultery perspective. I saw so many soldiers get screwed over when I was serving and also some really close friends. I always told them you need to leave that cheater. Look what they did to you. Values and virtues mean everything to me. I am by no means perfect, but my virtues are a cast iron wall with no secret ways in or out. For me, there is black and white, but then it happened to me. This is why I appreciate your writing about the ego 
and me. Really good advice, by the way. But this happened to me and now my 100% zero tolerance policy is wave red. I still love my wayward wife. Do I want to throw away the last 12 years or try out reconciliation and see if this is doable? I am trying, but the first hurdle is me getting over it. For me, it just happened still. I suppose I still feel the shock. I am deeply wounded, and thoughts are constantly seeping in and it's a full-time job just trying to let those thoughts run their course. Again, sage advice. Some of my conversations with my wayward wife right now are about this timeline of 2-5 years. She is worried that 2-5 years seems too long for me to be on the fence, and her to not know if this will work out. I agreed that I don't want to live her miserably for 2-5 years. I am doing the best I can right now. I am committed to trying to heal and committed to trying R. But like I said, I just don't know if I can mentally get over this. I guess at some point I'll wake up and just know whether I can or can't. I have only had two ender sessions at this point and I know the process will be long. I have just asked her to hang in there with me while we try. Does any time during the 2-5 years become easier at all? Or is it always a living hell? I know everyone is different. I guess it's just nice to hear that other people feel just as crazy and confused as I do. Thanks again for all the input and all the help. Comment, brother, thank you for your service, fellow military man here just differing service. 50% responsibilities for the marriage communication issues, 0% responsibilities for her affair actions. Now look in the mirror and repeat. Okay, many a good folk here have provided great information to you. Only you know your full circumstances, wayward wife and her pos AP. Take it slowly and one day at a time. It will be trial by mental combat. Your mind will throw you back into the desert as well as back when at a most vulnerable time in your life. She, who is most selfish, dumps the SHT sandwich. Those who cheat is very selfish. It is all about them, their wants and needs. It is never about the family or the spouse. Just them. They lie, manipulate, gaslight to control the fallout so they don't have to face the full bum fight they create. Please seek a MC and I see who specialized as infidelity. Not one of those hairy armpits. Come bar ya singing. Rug sweeping types that want you to wean her off the AP unicorn fart land lovers. Can I ask why after you decided that you respect yourself more, she then becomes willing to give your marriage another try? Did his mummy think a cheating spouse isn't good enough for her son? Brother communicate, journal, exercise, eat well, walk, talk to the family pet, walk more, seek legal advice, use all VA entitlements they are there to support you, and with anger and exercise it out, one day at a time.